and welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly Stevens. I'm the author of the Young Adult Fantasy Fury and Rising, and this is English Nerd. So in today's episode of All About a Tale of Two Cities, I'm going to be talking about book two, chapters 22 and 23. So this, the sea still rises and fire rises, which brings us almost to the end of book two. Not quite, but it shows the uh, advance of the French Revolution pretty clearly in these chapters. So before I begin, I wanted to show you a map. This is a map of France in 1789, which is the, the year that we're talking about here when the French Revolution really broke out with the storming of the Bastille. The wine shop of the Defarges is in Saint Antoine, the Saint Antoine quarter of Paris. And as you can see from this map, the Bastille, that prison, is right on the edge of Saint Antoine, just right on that northern side. The Bastille isn't actually there anymore if you go to France, but the stones were used to make a bridge, which I saw and it was really, it was really fascinating. Um, so the action in these chapters happens instead in a different part of Paris. So it still originates in Saint Antoine because the Defarges are really the driving force of the revolution in Dickens version, but instead of being in the Saint Antoine quarter, they all run over to a nearby area and go to the Hotel de Ville. So if you'll look again at the map, there's the Hotel de Ville. I know this section is a little busier to look at, but it has quite a few places that feature prominently at the end of A Tale of Two Cities. And the part that's relevant for today is the Hotel de Ville, which you'll see there kind of in the, um, on the right hand side. So without further ado, let's talk here. So the sea still rises. The sea still rises is called that because as you remember from the echoing footsteps chapter that you just, you know, that I just talked about, one of the main metaphors used to describe these revolutionary mobs is the sea, the ocean, both for its potential for cleansing what is what is wrong, you know, water does that, um, and especially its destructive power which we see really clearly in that chapter and in these. So the, the revolutionaries are starting to kind of come into their own here and be out in the open, really, because all of them are realizing the power that they have. Uh, the way that Dickens puts it is this. The raggedest nightcap awry on the wretchedest head had this crooked significance in it. I know how hard it has grown for me, the wearer of this, to support life in myself. But do you know how easy it has grown for me, the wearer of this, to destroy life in you? And then it describes the, the knitting women as well, who, who have discovered that their fingers can not only knit, but they can tear. So it's, it's pretty intimidating. Um, in the course of these two chapters, the, the revolutionaries, as they kind of come out as revolutionaries, switch their hats. They, they did wear blue hats, um, kind of as a symbol that they were a, a Jacques, that they were in on the, the coming revolution, that they were pro those ideas. And um, as of at least chapter 23, they start wearing red caps, and that's true throughout the rest of A uh, Tale of Two Cities. So before the action really happens in this chapter, we meet Madame Defarge's best friend, who is just the most perfectly named character, possibly, well, I don't know. There are a lot of good, well-named characters, but her name is The Vengeance. We never actually get her her actual name. We just learn that she's the wife of this starved grocer and that her name is The Vengeance. And it's just perfect. I mean, of course, Madame Defarge's best friend would be called The Vengeance. It's just symbolically ideal. And she really lives up to that name. Um, it says, for instance, that uh, as soon as they hear about this, this person who's on the register that they want to take down, it says, instantly Madame Defarge's knife was in her girdle, the drum was beating in the streets as if it and a drummer had flown together by magic, and the vengeance, uttering terrific shrieks and flinging her arms about her head like all the forty furies at once, was tearing from house to house, rousing the women. So we've had a couple of classical references so far. Uh, Madame Defarge is, is referred to repeatedly as a fate, not only for her knitting, but also her ability to, you know, snip the thread of life, if you're familiar with that uh, myth. 
But here we have that the women are like the Furies, specifically that the Vengeance is like the Furies, which is also really apt because in classical mythology, again, the Furies were these sort of demonic bird women, to oversimplify, who would chase down the very worst of humanity and basically drag them down to hell. You have them in Dante's Inferno, for instance, guarding the... the barrier between upper and lower hell because they kind of are the ones who bring the the people in lower hell to their fate in a way so um so that's the the vengeance <laughs> so that's the vengeance i say pleasantly all right anyway so defarge runs in he has his red cap on because now he's clearly the leader of or one of the leaders of this revolution and he has news for these people who are just itching for more blood. He says, Does everybody here recall old Fulan, who told the famished people that they might eat grass and who died and went to hell? Everybody from all throats. The news is of him. He is among us. So I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that name correctly. Fulan is spelled like this. Uh, it might be Faulon or something, but I don't have great French pronunciation. Feel free to correct me. In any case, this person is only important because of what what he said. He was He's a member of the upper class um, who said that the people could eat grass if they were hungry. And then he faked his own death out of fear of the lower class. There was a mock funeral. Now, we've already seen a mock funeral before in the Honest Tradesman chapter when Jerry Cruncher tries to dig up the body of Roger Cly to sell him for science. And uh, something goes wrong and the, and the body's not there. It's not the right body. Or in any case, there's some, something wrong with that funeral. So we have these, these fake deaths, these, these mistaken, uh, you know, misinformation campaigns uh, about several characters here, which all, again, feeds into that theme of resurrection. Uh, in this case, it's not a pleasant thing that he's alive. But he was thought dead, and now he is alive. Not for long, though. So he, uh, that is Fulan, is headed to the Hotel de Ville, which is where I showed you on that map. And so everybody goes running. Madame Defarge gets her knife. The vengeance is like all the furies. And the mob just flies together like that, um, just screaming for the head of Fulan. Now, the whole episode where they kill Fulan is actually pretty, pretty violent. You know, it, he doesn't die right away and it's, it's pretty nasty. But the, the most relevant part, in my opinion, is this. Okay, so they find, they find Fulan. The Defarges, husband and wife, the Vengeance and Jacques III were in the first press, the first press of people. And at no great distance from him, that is Fulan, in the hall. See, cried Madame, pointing with her knife. See that old villain bound with ropes? That was well done to tie a bunch of grass upon his back. Ha <laughs> ha, that was well done. Let him eat it now. Madame put her knife under her arm and clapped her hands as at a play. Okay, couple things. Couple things. First of all, we have an eye for an eye sort of vengeance here. He told the people that they could eat grass and now they're making him eat grass as they mob him and, and kill him. They put the grass on his back and they stuff his mouth with grass um, as we, as Madame Defarge suggests here. They do it later um, when they cut off his head. It's all stuffed with grass. It's gross. Um, so yeah, there's this violent eye for an eye justice happening and we also see another example of Madame Defarge um, not only being violent, but, but kicking things up a notch. In the previous chapter, we had the governor of the Bastille who was killed, and then Madame Defarge, after he's dead, chops off his head, mutilates the body. And here we have the mob killing Foulon. Um, they, they end up hanging him and suffocating him, I guess, with the grass. And she is enjoying it. She's not just wanting him dead. Again, it's not the lightning strike that the that Defarge sees the revolution being, but instead it's this all-consuming kind of earthquake. So yeah, she's she's honestly sadistic here. She's enjoying the pain that's being inflicted on Fulan. Others are just desperate for it because they they see this as a sort of 
you know, horrible kind of justice, but for her, she she gets pleasure out of it, which is which is messed up, but definitely worth pointing out. Those hints that we saw before that she's actually the most violent one uh, is coming coming to pass. Yeah, so they kill Fulan and his son-in-law as well because, again, it's not just the the upper class, the main people that that they're planning to kill. It's the chateau and uh, the chateau and all the race, like they said in the knitting chapter. It's people who are associated, so he dies too. At the end of that chapter, it says it was almost morning when Defarge's wine shop parted with its last knot of customers. And Monsieur Defarge said to Madame, his wife, in husky tones while fastening the door, At last it is come, my dear. Eh, well, returned Madame. Almost. Almost. What a chilling word. So, again, this underlines the difference between the Defarges. Monsieur Defarge wants justice to rain down on those people that wronged the lower class. He's been waiting for this his whole life. But Madame Defarge wants more. It's not only those who are guilty. It's it's ridding the earth of anyone associated and reveling in their pain. Um, so that is how that chapter ends. <laughs> um, and then we have fire rises. So the sea still rises and then fire rises. It's just everything's being consumed now by this, by this revolution. Um, there's less to say about this chapter, in my opinion. Uh, basically, as you know, all that all that really happens is that the the Marquis chateau uh, burns. The that not only his chateau but um, different chateaus around Paris get burned by uh, various mobs and arsonists who are kind of brought in for for that purpose. Um, there are just a couple of quick things that I feel are worth pointing out. Um, First of all, there it is. There's the most important thing. Um, so this is most of the way through the chapter, about halfway, a little past halfway. And uh, so Monsieur Gabel is, um, is alerted to the, to the chateau burning. Gabel is, he was, he was like the, what do, what do they call him? A functionary? He's the guy who runs the estate, basically, of of the Marquis. Since Darnay is actually the Marquis, say never mind, and everything belongs to him legally, um, but he's not there. Gabel is kind of the one who keeps the keeps the chateau running. So uh, he's alerted to what's going on, and he begs for for help. But this is the response. So the Mender of Roads kind of organizes this particular chateau um, arson. The Mender of Roads and 250 particular friends stood with folded arms at the fountain, looking at the pillar of fire in the sky. It must be 40 feet high, said they grimly, and never moved. So not only do they refuse to help, um, but they stand around the fountain, which is where... Uh, Gaspard's son was run over and then he was later hanged and they say mm, oh look the fire must be 40 feet high so I told you back in the knitting chapter to remember that Gaspard was hanged on a on a scaffold that was 40 feet high which is just an outrageous height for a scaffold there's no need for it to be that high except to make it a a um, example for the rest of the city or the little town and so when they say it must be 40 feet high and then they refuse to help, it's a really clear, again, eye for an eye sort of message to the upper class. You hanged our guy, we will burn your chateau. And it says that some of the other chateaus, some of the other functionaries and people who run were not as fortunate as Gobel, who doesn't seem all that fortunate. He does live through this chapter, but he's stuck He's trapped in his house by the mob at first, and then he goes up on his roof just in case they break through the door. And he's planning on like jumping off the roof and taking a couple guys with him if they if they try to get to him. But um, he doesn't end up he doesn't end up doing that. But Gabel is worth mentioning because in the next chapter, uh, drawn to the Lodestone Rock, he is a catalyst for really the whole last part of the of the book, even though he's a very minor character. 
yeah, so that is, that's it as far as I'm concerned with those two chapters. If you have any questions or comments, make sure to put them down below. Like this video if you like it. Don't forget to subscribe for more English nerdy goodness, and I'll see you soon.